What's up, Bug Dougaldini in the garage? Today I have something kind of cool for you. Uh, some of you may have seen our history of Jeep video. We'll link that up in the corner. Today I've compiled uh, an interesting video on the history of four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive. I read something really interesting recently that said that 40% of the vehicles on the road today are four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Now when you compare that with 100 years ago, that's incredible, all right? Um, for the majority of the time that that automotive, automobiles have been around, they were two-wheel drive. They were front engine, rear-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, done and done. So the fact that 40% of the vehicles on the road today are either all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive, I think that's pretty cool, especially on a channel like this where we celebrate all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive. So I thought it would be interesting to go through how we got from like 140 years ago when they were first starting to tinker around with automobiles. A lot of you know, Henry Ford gets um, credited as you know inventing the automobile. He just figured out how to mass produce it. People have been making automobiles for years before Henry Ford came along. And in fact, before the standard layout of internal combustion engine, front engine, rear wheel drive was decided upon that ruled for the majority of the 1900s, there were all kinds of crazy configurations, including some very wild early four wheel drive, all wheel drive systems. Let's start in England, 1893, the first four wheel drive system that was uh, valid enough to be put into a production vehicle is patented by Brahma Joseph Diplock, wild name I know. He patents a four wheel drive, four wheel steer steam engine to be used as an agricultural tractor. It's the first, it's the, the first vehicle that we can point at and say, yes, that was a viable four wheel drive system. Uh, after him, the next viable four wheel drive system came in 1899 from Ferdinand Porsche, the Porsche that you're thinking of, Porsche, if you're overseas. He actually made a hybrid electric uh, four wheel drive vehicle for the Porsche Loaner Company, I believe it was called the Porsche Loaner Mixe. Uh, it used an internal combustion engine to charge up and power, an, uh, you know, f for an electric motor, um, which really illustrates how uh, nebulous the um, design for a vehicle was in the early years of automobiles. Today, we think you know a car is f you, typically your production cars are going to be front engine, internal combustion, front or rear wheel, whatever, but they were doing all kinds of stuff back then. Steam engines, hybrid electric engines, internal combustion engines, um, front wheel, mid-mounted, uh, all kinds of stuff. It wasn't until well into the 19-teens when the platform as we know it that dominated most of the 1900s, internal combustion engine in the front, two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive was really established. From there, we move into the 1900s where four-wheel drive starts to pick up some steam, no pun intended, uh, with the 1903 invention and patent of the Stryker 60 HP. It's a Dutch manufactured four-wheel drive vehicle. This one is significant for a number of reasons. It was the first ever six-cylinder internal combustion engine created, uh, and it was put into the uh, first four-wheel drive vehicle to have four-wheel disc brakes. And it was built specifically for the 1903 Paris to Madrid road race. Uh, the success of vehicles like the um, Porsche Loner uh, vehicle and the Spyker 60 HP vehicle prompted an American company to form to build four-wheel drive vehicles uh, called the American Four-Wheel Drive Company. Uh, confusingly known as FWD, which is weird because they FWD was known as like four wheel drive. That was the company. But today when you see FWD, you think of front wheel drive, but they dominate four wheel drive in the United States for most of the early 1900s. The only other company really competing with them in the early 1900s in the United States is the Thomas B. Jeffrey company. Both companies, FWD and the Jeffrey company build vehicles for World War One, which as we discussed, in the Jeep video, and if you just know anything about history, World War One is a very pivotal war for technology. You have horse-mounted cavalry on the same battlefield with machine guns and tanks, rudimentary early tanks. And so there really is this huge discrepancy between old tech and the new tech coming in. And it's the first modern war, the first war fought with modern weapons. And so you see a lot of wild things, the first tanks, um, the first 
four-wheel drive vehicles on a battlefield, and that really helped to validate the, the need for four-wheel drive was World War I. When we come out of World War I, every country on the planet, a light bulb goes off and they say, we can't do this with horses. Tanks are not necessarily a cure-all for all situations. We need to figure out what our war vehicles are going to be going forward and four-wheel drive is the answer. So in the uh, aftermath of World War One, every country on the planet is looking for a way to four-wheel drive their military, and we get a lot of really interesting um, solutions to that problem. First real contender coming out of World War One is the Mercedes-Benz G1. Uh, it's built off of an earlier two-wheel drive design, but they start to perfect that, and that is, in fact, the predecessor to some of the war vehicles you would see later on. Now, a common misconception, this is jumping a few ahead a few years, um, the only real competition for the Jeep in World War II was the Volkswagen Kubelwagen. Um, the misconception is that those were four-wheel drive. They were not. They were just the most wildly capable two-wheel drive vehicle you've ever seen. So in the United States in 1931, the Marmon Harrington Company is derived. They don't build their own vehicles for the most part, but they sell conversion kits or do conversion kits for Ford trucks. So this is going to be your first instance of Ford four-wheel drive systems. Originally, you got a, a Ford truck in two-wheel drive, and if you needed it in four-wheel drive, you'd send it to Marmon Harrington and they would convert it for you the way you'd send a truck to Hennessy or something today. So that's how you got your first production four-wheel drive vehicles in the United States. Um, after that, Dodge comes out with the one and a half ton K39 X4. Uh, this is going to be the predecessor to the power wagon of the 19. Uh, 50s, 60s, and on. Um, and this thing is a powerhouse. It's the first four-wheel drive vehicle to use an in-cab lever. So that's you know like the lever we all have down there in our Jeep. Before that. Your, your vehicle was either in four-wheel drive all the time, or maybe you just had locking hubs, or some you'd even have to, um, I think it was on Max, early, I'm not certain about this, but um, I think early Mac four-wheel drive was chain-driven, front and rear, and so when you wanted to put it into four-wheel drive, you had to add the chain to the front. So the, um, uh, the Dodge K39 is the first instance where you have on-demand four-wheel drive. You also still had locking hubs, of course, but uh, all these small little innovations are really making a huge difference and leading us towards that 40% four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive that we have today. It should be mentioned that all these vehicles were really only used for military use, um, with the exception of Marmon Harrington, but uh, who was, you know, converting Ford uh, trucks. But like the Dodge K39, you weren't just buying that as your your daily driver, even agricultural, really. You had tractors for that. Um, these are military use vehicles uh, here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Now, elsewhere in the world, leading up to World War II, a few other companies are building four-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, in Japan, Japan is industrializing quickly in this time before World War II. 1936, they come out with their own four-wheel drive reconnaissance car for military use. It comes in a two-door, four-door, and pickup style, but it only has a 1.3 liter two-cylinder engine, and that kind of differentiates it from the rest of the world. Japan has a long history of underpowering vehicles but still making it work, arguably. Um, after this, uh, Mercedes-Benz G5 builds on the G1. It is a four-wheel drive vehicle with locking hubs. Uh, it is basically the grandfather to the G-Wagons that we know today. You know, the Mercedes G-Wagon, the shoebox on wheels. Uh, the, the G5 is really where that line started. Uh, in 1938, uh, in Russia, they uh, developed their first 4x4 military use vehicle, the GAZ-61. Uh, and it's these are all kind of copies of each other. There wasn't a lot of originality going on right now. Everybody saw what everyone else was doing and building up. And as it became obvious that war was imminent, more and more countries were rushing to either build their own four-wheel drive vehicles or equip uh, their military with you know vehicles built in another country. All right, this is where. Um, 
this is where Jeep comes in. All right. Now, before World War II, this is what the United States was using as four wheel drive vehicles for the military. All right. For their uh, half ton trucks, they were using Ford half tons with the Marmon Harrington conversion kits. They were using the one and a half ton Dodge WC, which is uh, the predecessor or the successor rather of the um, uh, K39. They have a Chevy two and a half ton, the G506, and then they have the Max six ton six by six truck. That is what their arsenal looks like. You will notice one thing. These are all very heavy trucks. These are moving lots of cargo. You hear them coming from you know miles away, and they're moving slow type of trucks. As we are entering World War II, and I went over this in the history of Jeep video, but it becomes apparent to the United States that even if we manage to stay how some somehow stay out of this war, we are going to have to be able to aid our allies. Uh, and if you know anything about U.S. history, lend lease with Britain. We did everything we could. FDR was doing everything he could, even though the uh, he was actually congressionally banned from giving aid to a belligerent in war time, uh, he found ways around it with Lend-Lease and some other things to help England, to help the Allies until we got in there. One of the ways they did that was, as everybody knows, by commissioning uh, the lightweight reconnaissance vehicle uh, in 1940, that the, the, the thing that later became the Jeep. And I'm just going to brush over this as much as I want to dig into Jeep history, because I'll talk about Jeep history any day, have a whole video on it. So go check that out if you want to know the full history. But here were the requirements that the U.S. government handed down to 139 different automakers uh, when they were looking for their new reconnaissance vehicle. All right. Had to be four wheel drive. Had to be able to hold at least a crew of three. Had to have a wheelbase of 75 inches. This was later changed to 80 inches. Uh, it had to have a track of 47 inches. Had to have a fold-down windshield. Had to carry at least 660 pounds, including the three-man crew. Uh, it had to have an engine capacity of 85 foot-pounds, which was actually a lot for back then. Uh, and the curb weight had to be no more than 1,300 pounds. All right. The requirement was that if this vehicle got stuck in the mud or something, that four men could pick it up and move it. That was the expectation with this truck. That four men were, I mean, you know, not maybe put it on their shoulders, but at least be able to pick it up and maneuver it and jimmy it on out. The Bantam Car Company out of Butler, Pennsylvania is the first one and the only one really. The other problem with this, first of all, this is actually a pretty... Um, ambitious list of things. It sounds easy today, but back then this was not a simple task. You know, you could have that much power, but you couldn't have that little weight or this, that, and the third. Um, they gave some crazy truncated uh, production time because they needed to get it built for war of something like 49 days. The Bantam Car Company essentially wins the bid. Uh, the Bantam Car Company is a very tiny automaker out of Butler, Pennsylvania. Uh, the government deems them too small and asks Willis uh, Overland and Ford to please look at their designs and Bantam's designs and um, provide the government with their own version of it. Um, the government ends up liking Willis's designs the most and asks Ford to please help Willis Overland make their Jeep. So Bantam builds the original designs. Willis wins the bid with modified designs and Ford helps them build it. Um, that is how we got the Jeep uh, in the most brief terms a diehard Jeep and history lover could possibly give them in. Uh, as I already mentioned, the uh, counterpart of the Jeep in World War II um, was the Kubelwagen, which was not four-wheel drive. It did have a locking differential, but it was not four-wheel drive. None of them were, which is crazy. If you've ever seen footage of a Kubelwagen, <laughs> it's insane that they're not four-wheel drive, but uh, they are just not. All right, now after the war, up until now, from the end of World War I through World War II, four-wheel drive only exists for the purpose of the military, really. Yes, some agricultural, yes, some industrial applications, but the thing that was driving uh, new technology in that field was military use. After, four, after World War II, civilians become interested. These troops come back from World War II and they say, man, I was driving this little Jeep thing all over the South Pacific, all over Italy and France. 
I kind of want one. It's going to be kind of hard to go back to driving in a passenger car. So in 1945, Willis Overland acquires the Jeep trademark and the designs for the Willie MB, and they build their own civilian version of the Jeep, the CJ2A. Very iconic, flat fenders. Looks a lot like a World War II Jeep, but there are some differences. And they start selling them to the public. And in fact, the Jeep was first, and I mentioned this as well, it wasn't really sold and marketed totally as a, uh, you know, a, just a, a passenger vehicle or a recreational vehicle. They made attachments for the CJ2A. You could get a backhoe, um, you know, a, a York rake, anything you could need or do with a tractor, you could put on your CJ2A. And it was billed as you can till the fields with it and then it'll take the family to church on Sunday. They wanted it to be the one vehicle you had for everything. Um it didn't really work, but it you know Jeeps did get a cult following, as you know. Uh, other companies start to make four-wheel drive vehicles more available to the public. Uh, Dodge takes their earlier designs from the K39 and some other vehicles, and they put out the Power Wagon. The WDX is the actual production name, but they put out the Power Wagon, and this thing is just an absolute friggin' monster. Uh, giant utility vehicle. It's heavy duty, used uh, for agricultural reasons. You could get it as a tow truck, you could get it as a beam truck, um, and you start seeing more and more work being done in the private sector with four-wheel drive vehicles. Similarly, uh, over in Europe, other companies are starting to build four-wheel drive vehicles for the private sector. In 1947, Mercedes uh, designs the first Unimog, which is really your ultimate utility four-wheel drive. It has something called portal gears, which if you know, I mean, picture a differential with two tires on the end. The differential is in the middle. The axles are in the middle and of the wheels right here. Portal gears are a set of gears that go on the hub to move the axle to the top of it. So it has insane ground clearance. The Unimog was built the same way the CJ2A was. It had every attachment known to man. It was made for agricultural needs, um, not quite as many on-road amenities and, and as much on-road manners as the CJ2A. It was a workhorse. It was so capable that Mercedes had to get permission from the global community to build the Unimog. They had to prove that it wasn't Germany building another war machine. There were obviously some pretty significant sanctions put against Germany after World War II as to what they can and cannot build um, uh, to prevent, you know, World War III, because they are just, they are just friggin' good at starting World Wars. But that's how cool and capable the Unimog is. Um, the, the global community saw them building and said, hold up, hold up, hold up. We fell for this once before. I don't think so. Uh, but thankfully, they were allowed to make it. Uh, 1948 in England, the first ever Land Rover, uh, the Land Rover Series 1 4x4 is built. Um, basically your British version of the Jeep. You know, yes, the military used it and it was tried and tested and perfected in the deserts of Africa and India, but also available to the public. And it starts to foster a love of four wheel drive and off-roading, you know, in the public sector, which is what we're getting at in this video. So we move into the 1950s where, you know, Jeep has uh, been building family style um, station wagons, four-wheel drive station wagons for a number of years now, and it's starting to become more normal to see four-wheel drive cars just out in public. They're not obviously just military like they were pre-World War II, but as we're getting into the 50s and 60s, they're also no longer just agricultural. You can own a four-wheel drive vehicle if you're a hunter or your family likes to go camping, or you guys live near the beach and you want to be able to drive on the beach. It's not, it wouldn't be weird to see them out there. And as a result of that, you start seeing more and more production of vehicles coming with four wheel drive. 1951, Toyota makes the first four x four Land Cruiser. I don't like Toyota, not even a little bit, but I do respect the Land Cruiser. Uh, it's a heck of a vehicle. It's been built for a heck of a long time and it's gotten a lot of people into off-roading, four-wheel driving, for sure. Fun story about <laughs> about Toyota. When they first built the FJ40, right after World War II, they called it the Toyota Jeep. <laughs> and Willie's over them was like, hey man, so you can't do that. <laughs> so come up with another name. And uh, they come up with FJ. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's pretty obvious where that name came from, but uh, uh, whatever. I won't make this a Toyota hate video. Sorry. We have some Toyota... Uh, 
fans on the channel and it's baffling to me why you guys would stick around because I'm kind of an ass to Toyota all the time. But I re we have a, a frenemies thing. There is mutual respect. Uh, moving on, 1955. The This, I think, is an incredibly pivotal event. It's the Oxford-Cambridge Cross-African Expedition. And what it is is six undergrad students, uh, three from Cambridge, three from Oxford, get in two Land Rover Series 1s and they drive 18,000 miles over the course of six months and six days from England down to Africa. And there are, are no highways. This is not a direct road. It's through uncharted territory unbroken land they're sometimes riding on rough trails um trails that are really just for horses or no trails at all forging their own way in these only lightly modified land rovers they had winches um and uh you know uh, spotlights and extra gas cans but nothing like today where you're lifted up six inches on 38s no man these guys just and they had an uh, an urge for adventure they had an itch for it and so they outfitted these two land rovers and they made it happen and so what you're seeing here is the beginning of the hobbyist off-roading scene. This, there was no reason for this trip. There was no military purpose. There was no industrial, agricultural reason for this trip. They just wanted to go off-roading. And so they did. And in a lot of ways, I think you could look at this as the beginning of the overlanding scene um, that we have today, maybe even off-roading, you know? Uh, these guys probably would have enjoyed the Rubicon Trail quite a bit uh, as well. Uh, moving into the 60s, you see an explosion of four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive is no longer, it, it's cemented now. It's a fun thing. It's here to stay. And as a result, you start to see some really wild four-wheel drive vehicles being put out. Uh, let's go through the list. 1963, the Wagoneer debuts. It's the first four-wheel drive with automatic. It's the first four-wheel drive that had luxury aspects to it before this four-wheel drive whether they were land rovers or jeeps or toyotas they were bare bones they were still had that getting work done feel to it no man you could get a wagoneer with all the amenities every fancy luxury amenity you could imagine in 1963 you could get in a wagoneer but you could also take this thing anywhere you wanted it to go 1950, uh, 1965, the first Ford Bronco, arguably next to the Jeep, the most important American four-wheel drive vehicle as far as furthering the culture of four-wheel drive. Uh, here's something interesting. 1966 in Britain, the Jensen FF. It's the first ever GT car built as an all-wheel drive vehicle. This is the first time that four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive is not put in a truck, SUV, full-frame, chassis type situation. So this vehicle is the predecessor to all of the all-wheel drive cars we have today. Subarus, Mitsubishi Evos, whatever else, a Quattro, Audi, Audi Quattro. They all originate from the ideas put down by the Jensen FF, which was a 60-40 split between front and rear, which is what Subaru does today. In the 60s, it's the first time you're seeing luxury options for four-wheel drive. It's the first time you're seeing vehicles that have no real use to a farmer or to the military getting four-wheel drive, and you're getting a different segment. You had the off-roaders, you had the rugged survivalists, um, overlanders, but now you're also getting like speed enthusiasts and race enthusiasts. The next important milestone, in my opinion, the first Baja 1000 race is held in 1967. If you know anything about Baja 1000 race is really very interested. It was originally a trail conceived by Honda in 1962 to test the CL72 Mustang. They wanted to find a way to test the endurance of their, their new motorcycle. Um, and so they developed this course, a thousand miles through the deserts of Southern California and Baja. And after a few years, it caught on as a proving ground for vehicles. Uh, it caught on as kind of like a standard, like how fast could you and your vehicle make it through to the point in 1967 where it organizes as a race. It's televised, it's broadcast, it is um, advertised. And the effect it has is to really mainstream this. You know, kids now are seeing four-wheel drive vehicles and four-wheel drive races, and it's something to aspire to, and it's helping people uh, become more aware of it, which obviously drives the uh, 
manufacturers to make more four wheel drive vehicles. The last mentionable vehicle, um, for the 1960s, of course, the Chevy Blazer. I don't know why Chevy's always two steps behind Ford, but they are, uh, whether it's the Ford, uh, the Mustang and Camaro, or the Bronco and the Blazer. But in 1969, uh, Chevy finally gets to the party, and I love the Blazer just as much as I love the Bronco, 100%. As we move into the 1970s, all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive gets taken out of the hands of just the big truck type guys, and it starts getting into cars more and more. Uh, car companies are realizing, hey, we can make really safe cars, really capable cars, really fun cars with all-wheel drive. Now, in 1972, Subaru comes out with their first four-wheel drive vehicle, and I call it four-wheel drive because that's 100% what it is. You couldn't, it was a part-time four-wheel drive system, the Subaru Leon. It couldn't be used on dry pavement. You had to stay in two-wheel drive. They didn't have their first all-wheel drive till later, but we still must note this because there's no doubt that Subaru has done more for all-wheel drive passenger vehicles, cars, small cars, sedans, uh, than any other vehicle. You know, when you think all-wheel drive, you think Subaru. And so that 40% number that I keep going back to, I know for a fact Subaru has a big part of that. Because the trucks are always going to be around, right? They have been since the beginning, since uh, Marmon Harrington started converting four-wheel drive, four-by-four four trucks. You know, people could get trucks um the fact that more and more cars now are becoming all-wheel drive that's all on subaru another huge milestone in the 1970s was uh jeep first came out with quadra track now quadra track is just the limited slip transfer case that's really all it is and it's gone through a bunch of variations in fact quadra drive that i have in this jeep that i'm sitting in right now is just the great grandson of quadra track but it's the first true all-wheel drive system that you don't have to think about all right it's on when you're on dry pavement it's on when you're on wet pavement and it's still on when you get off road and that is huge it used a borgs warner limited slip transfer case that was absolutely bulletproof uh they put it in the wagoneer and the cherokee and people loved it people loved it it was reliable you didn't have to think about it um and that's when we start making the shift from four-wheel drive all-wheel drive being something a feature that you have that you have to think about and you have to plan for to the all-wheel drive that we have today where you don't even think about it both my mother and my father have Subaru Foresters they're great for up here in Jersey in the winter because you don't even have to ever think about it all right I've had Subarus it's awesome you don't think to put it in a four-wheel drive this thing that I'm in right now you don't think about it you're just in it so when when I hit ice or something I know I'm already in it and that I think this the reason I mentioned this and I'm spending so much time on the 1973 debut of Jeep's Quadra track this this is how we get to that 40% number. It has to be something that people don't think about, all right? Because the, the enthusiasts are always going to buy it. I'm an enthusiast. You're probably an enthusiast. Enthusiasts want that control. We want to have to choose when to put it in. But for it to become mainstream, it needs to be a safety feature. And to be a safety feature, it has to be always on. The select track that's in my, my other Grand Cherokee, it's not a safety feature because I have to plan to put it on. So if I hit black ice and I wasn't planning to hit black ice, Having four-wheel drive didn't do anything for me because it wasn't on anyway. This all-wheel drive that's in my Quadra drive, that's in your Subaru, that's in your Audi Quattro, that's in a lot of things these days, that is a safety feature and that's what makes it standard equipment on vehicles. As we move into the 1980s, AMC uh, puts out the Eagle in 1980. The Eagle is the first American production car to have full-time four-wheel drive. Uh, they use the 249 transfer case that uh, ZJ guys are going to recognize. Uh, it's essentially the first crossover SUV. It's a tiny little wagony thing but it's got all-wheel drive, super capable, super robust and sturdy, uh, but still reasonable gas mileage for what they're offering. Uh, also in 1980, Audi Quattro. Audi Quattro is huge. It's a permanent all-wheel drive system. It's a tame all-wheel drive system. Even the 249, you still kind of feel like you're in a truck that looks like a car, all right? Uh, even in the Subaru Leon, you know, like I mentioned, you can't use it on the pavement all the time. So you're in a truck that feels like a car. Audi Quattro is going to be your first true tame four-wheel drive system. This brings us to Group B Rally Racing. Group B Rally Racing is introduced by FAA in 1982 to replace Group 4 and Group 5. The hallmark of Group B, if you don't know, is that it had no friggin' rules. It had very low homologation rules and just very few rules on what 
anybody could do. And so it bred a ton of really cool for, uh, technology, a lot of which was four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive related. Some of the notable vehicles that came out of Group B, it's gonna be your Audi Quattro A2, your Ford RS200, and your Subaru XT. Now the XT is gonna be the predecessor to all the other Subaru vehicles that we know today. Group B took Subaru and made them take a left turn. And that's where you get your WRX, that's where you get your STI, uh, all of the rally cred that they have today started when they got involved in Group B. Um, Mitsubishi is the same way. Your, your Lancer Evolution, it can look back to Group B and thank Group B for making it what it is today. Now, <clears throat> this is important to our story because you already had the farm boys interested in four-wheel drive, all right? And then you had some of the outdoorsy types, but now with Group B and all the all-wheel drive vehicles going on in there, now you have a whole nother set of tuner type guys that are all of a sudden interested in buying four-wheel drive vehicles. And this is how you see the market explode. Subaru starts selling production versions. Uh, Audi starts selling production versions. And a ton of others. I'm not really big into the European car scene, um, but everybody had a car in Group B, at least one, and most of them, a lot of them, were four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. And that's super important um, because people are seeing these things saying, I want that thing, man. I want that uh, RS200, <laughs> you know? How do I get one of those? And uh, the car companies responded by making, obviously watered down, but production models of these vehicles. Another important thing uh, to happen in the 80s is going to be the release of the um, Suzuki SJ Samurai. If you are not familiar with the SJ Samurai, get familiar. The SJ Samurai is one of the coolest, most capable four-wheel drive vehicles ever. And what it contributed to our lifestyle is that it made it crazy approachable. It was a small, inexpensive, efficient, reliable, durable, capable four-wheel drive vehicle. It was small enough that if you lived in the city, you could have it. It was efficient enough that if you were broke, you could still own one. You could buy one. You could maintain it. You could own it. But on the weekends, you could go and rock crawl with the CJs and the Broncos and keep up with them every step of the way. It helped start to shrink what was acceptable as an SUV. Right now, at the same time, in 84, you've got the Cherokee out there, and the Cherokee's helping to do that too. Cherokee is the first... A unibody SUV that really had any cred off-road. Uh, and I know you Wrangler guys are going to argue a little bit on that point, but you can't ignore it, man. Cherokees can do some stuff. These little Samurais could do some stuff. If you see a Bronco or a Blazer or a Land Cruiser out there, you're like, yeah, of course you can. You know, it just looks, you can see it from two miles away and you know that it's capable off-road. If you see an SJ Suzuki it kind of looks like a geo tracker and you're thinking that thing is going to get stuck in a pothole and it did not. So they are incredibly important to making four wheel drive more available to everybody. As you get into the nineties, the SUVs are here to stay. The trucks are here to stay. Subaru is here to stay. 1996, Subaru adopts the boxer engine. They standardize the symmetrical all wheel drive that is their hallmark. Subaru in the 90s is like an iceberg. You see this little 10% up top, this little weird company from overseas. They've got the blue and yellow rally. You kind of know who they are. You kind of don't. You feel like maybe the art teacher drives one of those, but you don't really know anything else about them. What you don't see underwater, this 90% of them that is just building, perfecting. And by the time they released the Forester in 98, Subaru has it perfected. The boxer engine's perfected. Their transmissions are perfected. Their symmetrical all-wheel drive is perfected. Their 60-40 split is perfected. They have it down. And what that does is it, 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 it completes the final piece. All right. I was talking before about how all-wheel drive needs to become a safety feature for it to become mainstream. Subaru does that. It was not Audi Quattro that did that. It was not uh, Eagle Talon, uh, excuse me, um, AMC Eagle that did that. It certainly wasn't any of the big trucks that have a horrible reputation for flipping over. It's Subaru. They were so good in the 90s that they seemed weird. People are like, that's such a weird car company. It wasn't that they were weird. It's that they were 20 years ahead of their time. All right. They were doing in 96 
what people are just catching up to in 2016. Seriously, all right? Think about it today, all the little car brands that are making small, affordable, reliable, all-wheel drive passenger cars and wagons. Subaru was the only one doing it back then, all right? You could get one of these weird um, uh, four-wheel drive type vehicles, or you could get some expensive Audi Quattro, or you could go and get a truck or a Jeep. Everybody said, cool, we got the SUV, selectable four-wheel drive is easy. Transfer cases have been around since the 1930s. That's easy. Borg Warner, new process, new venture, whatever. Let's perfect all-wheel drive. Let's make it reliable. Let's make it inexpensive. Let's make it infallible. And so that's how we got to that number, that 40% number. We were never going to get there with just guys like me. I'm always going to drive four-wheel drive. You got farmers out here in, in, you know, that are always going to drive four-wheel drive. You got guys who are into camping or hunting that are always going to drive four-wheel drive. You got guys that live in the city that for some reason are always going to drive four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive guys are not what's making up that 40% number. It's the fact that car companies have figured out how to make four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive safe and then it becomes standard. And the winners of all this is really us, because we get some awesome vehicles. Vehicles are so much more capable now than they were even 30 years ago. 30 years ago, if you didn't want to drive around some kind of big, inefficient truck, you had two-wheel drive, whether it was front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive, that's all there was to it. We're in a better place because vehicles are being driven with all four wheels. Let's take a minute to appreciate how far we've come since, you know, okay, so in uh, 1919, the, you know, the uh, Russia's becoming communist and the world's recovering from World War I. If you wanted to drive a four wheel drive vehicle, you probably had to buy a military surplus or you had to buy some conversion kit for another production vehicle. All right, in just 100 years, we've gone from that where nobody gets four wheel drive to today, when most people, well, no, 40% is still under the most number, but I'm going to say most people have access to a four-wheel drive car. I bet that in the uh, in the northern states where we get snow here in the United States, 75% of the cars you see on the road are all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. Bold prediction. So there it is, man. That's all I got on that. Um, that is my love letter to all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive. I'd love to hear what you guys think. What do you think is the biggest innovation, the most important thing in this whole story I told. And I'm sticking with, even though Jeep had nothing to do with it, and that breaks my heart, the uh, Cambridge Oxford expedition. I think that that represents a shift in the psyche from four-wheel drive, agricultural, military, industrial to, huh, so you're saying if I buy a four-wheel drive, I can go anywhere. I think I would like to do that. I think I will buy a four-wheel drive. That's what I'm pinpointing as the um, as the main point. Uh, like I said, if you're interested in more Jeep history, by all means, go check out that History of Jeep video. Let me know what you think of this video and this history that I told. Uh, definitely let me know your favorite vehicle that we mentioned. Mine is going to be the Wagoneer. Yeah, for sure. Um, because the Wagoneer gave us the modern SUV as we know it. All right, uh, that's it. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time.